Welcome to episode 65 of the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I'm a board-certified sports dietitian and runner based in Santa Cruz, California. I provide virtual nutrition ser- services to teenage and adult athletes of all abilities, and I host this podcast to demonstrate that there is no one-size-fits-all nutrition approach towards optimal health and performance. My guest today is sports dietitian and distance runner Kelsey Pontius. Kelsey grew up playing competitive soccer, but eventually entered her career as a D1 soccer player to transform into a distance runner who has since qualified for both the 2020 and 2024 U.S. Marathon Olympic trials. She also is the founder of her private practice, Meteor Nutrition, which is based in Jacksonville, Florida. Today, we chat all about two topics that Kelsey and I are both passionate about, nutrition during injury and optimizing iron status. We really get into great detail and hopefully answer any and all questions you might have on these issues, which of course affect so many athletes. I hope you find it helpful. So without further ado, please enjoy my discussion all about injury and iron status in athletes with fellow sports RD, Kelsey Pontius. Kelsey, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How's everything going for you today? Oh, so great. Um, It's one of those days where I feel like I'm in the shoes of a lot of my clients because it's a, it's a bigger training day for me. I always kind of feel, I don't know if you ever feel this way, but when you take time away from family and work and stuff like that for your own training, it's one of those days where I like have two runs and a lift and I get to practice everything we always talk about and see each other post about. Awesome. Yes. Yes. I totally get it. Uh, what are you training for right now? Anything specific? Oh, question. Um, I wanted to come a little bit down in my volume from the fall. And so, um, I've been working on like shorter distance type of things. Um, so like mile 5k and I have some fun, um, track stuff, um, in the, in the summer. And then I'll ultimately run grandma's half, which is not too far different, but just approach it from like the speed side opposed to like more of the strength marathon side. Awesome. And, you know, and just in case someone, you know, people in my audience aren't familiar with you, before we kind of dive into today's topics, I'd love for you just to share your background because you are a very, very fast runner. So I really want to hear all about you as an athlete, um, as well as as a performance dietitian. Oh, thank you. Um, So I actually started my athletic journey as a soccer player. So Mm. one of those, um, I started playing when I was three and Um, yeah, I ended up playing all the way through college and, um, then after, or actually middle of college, I didn't finish all four years as a soccer player, but long story short, we might get into it. Um, I ended up transferring from the, um, university that I played for and wasn't a student athlete at all and picked up distance running. Um, and this is hysterical, but I literally wanted to have friends. And so (laughs) When you have been on a team your whole life, and then all of a sudden you're not on a team, um, you get like, you're not an athlete anymore. And then you're like, wait, how do I meet friends? And so running such an inviting space. And as an adult that like, doesn't have a built-in group at a new university, it was a very natural segue from, I think that's a really common thing that like student athletes kind of do is they find running, they sign up for a half marathon or whatever. So you and I were just chatting about your 50k. The first distance mm-hmm. I ever ran was a 50k. No uh, way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. And I look back in hindsight and I'm like, thank goodness I was coming from a sport like soccer where, you know, there's um just I think that it really helped me stay resistant to injury because I did not know what I was doing and I did not have a coach. Nobody was guiding me. My, I did not know what fueling for endurance events looked like. And so by the grace of God, and probably just being a soccer player and having like a contact sport and a big strength program behind me, I think that somehow I didn't get hurt, um, training, Mm -hmm. doing that 50 K. And so, um, I kind of got the runner bug after the 50 K and, um, you know, long story short, ended up getting a coach and really loving competing and finding that competitive side. Um, Soccer actually ended because I had multiple concussions my sophomore year. And um, so anyway, since then, I've really enjoyed the process of racing and have had the opportunity to qualify for the U.S. Olympic marathon trials twice since um, becoming a runner. 
That's so awesome. So awesome. Um, and what about as a dietitian? Share a little bit about, about you as a sports dietitian. Yes. Yeah, so when I was in high school, I tore my ACL playing soccer, really common injury, especially for um, females in high school. And I just became so curious, Claire, about what role does nutrition play? And I didn't have the information accessible. Um, I mean, I had my surgery. I was thinking about this the other day, like almost 20 years ago. Wow. So, yes. I'm like aging myself right now. Uh, <laughs> but you know, in terms of like what to do to heal, um, I didn't have that kind of information. And so I was just really curious of like, okay, I'm not playing soccer anymore. What does that mean? Fortunately, I had a really healthy relationship with food and a really normal upbringing. So I didn't really struggle with that. So I'm really thankful for like be, having a soccer background at that part of it, because I think that it might've looked a little bit different had I been in um, a runner or something like that. Um, and then um, when I went to school, I was originally a kinesiology major and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with it, but still like I wanted to play more minutes than some of my teammates. And um, I would notice really big discrepancies with like how my teammates were eating versus the minutes they were getting to be played. And I wanted to know what the connection was. And we didn't have any RDs on staff and I didn't even know what an RD was. And I think that we had like one conversation about nutrition and it was the food pyramid. And here I am. Sure. Again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm older than you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there just wasn't um, this information that I think that we have now when it comes to performance nutrition. And I think there was just this underlying curiosity. So um, when I transferred schools, I switched my major to nutrition and dietetics and um, had really great professors and had a really great dietetic internship where I worked underneath um, Tara Guidas, who is the dietitian for, or at that time for the Orlando Magic, and she worked at UCF. So I had a rotation with her, and it really opened my eyes to the um, to the opportunities in sports. And I I started right out of school. I worked um, in acute care, and then I had a little bit of experience working in a rehabilitation hospital, which I really like both of those experiences. I don't think that necessarily all dietitians need to start that way, but I think that mm -hmm. it was good for me to like use that clinical part of my mind. Um, and I really liked the experience, but I knew that eventually I wanted to do what I'm doing now, which is own a private practice. Yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been in private practice for? Since 2018. So there was a period of time where um, I was still working for that rehabilitation hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was first starting Meteor and then, um, there was kind of that tipping point where, um, I was just working now at that hospital on the weekends. And then, um, I met my husband and I wanted to spend time with him on the weekends. And it got to the point where I got so busy with Meteor that I was like, oh man, I would pay that the amount that I'm going to make at the rehab hospital to not go. And he's like, I yeah. need <laughs> you, to, you to quit. <laughs> yeah. And you're based in Florida. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. So let's get into today's topics now. So we're kind of doing two different topics. I mean, they are somewhat related, but we're treating them slightly separately. Uh, we're talking about iron status and nutrition relating to injury. These are, of course, both very common problem areas for athletes. So let's start with iron and maybe you can kick things off by explaining why iron is such a key micronutrient for athletes. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I believe that it's due to the role in production of ATP in aerobic metabolism. So what that means in just like layman's terms for the athlete is that if you are low in iron or having issues with your iron status, then your ability to um, train and adapt and your performance is going to be tremendously hindered. It's going to affect things like your VO2 max, um, how easy or comfortable training feels. And then um, at severe stages of iron deficiency, um, it will affect how you feel just in your day to day. A lot of my clients um, will share when they have issues with their iron that they want to nap all day. And I'm sure we can get into symptoms, but mm -hmm. um, really big deal from just basic function. Um, but a lot of times I think that symptoms are noticed at the performance level first. Yeah. And as dietitians, um, how do we assess if an athlete's iron status is optimal? Um, and, and I think this is important for, you know, also clients and just, you know, whoever to, to kind of be aware of what to look for, you know, so whether that's symptoms or blood work, um, what are we looking at? 
Yeah. So I think that you probably have a similar experience of sometimes people reach out to you because they know that their iron status is poor. Whereas yep. sometimes someone might be a client or an athlete that you're working with and they're sharing symptoms. And we kind of have that eye of like, oh, sounds like um, a ferritin status or iron um, hemoglobin, those kinds of things are, are impacted. So our curious, curious minds um, kind of push that person to go get some lab work so we can confirm or, or deny. So um, I would say like first kind of symptoms, um, you know, that fatigue, having difficulty breathing, um, you know, sometimes noticing things with like um, nails, um, pica, so craving things like dirt, ice, that kind of thing um, surely has been a symptom that I've noticed with my clients. Um, things just feeling harder and just kind of like, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm unable to run paces that should feel easy to me. Um, those kinds of things. And then sometimes like, you know, I'm never surprised when I find a certain symptom is linked to iron deficiency, like even issues sleeping. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've seen when people kind of change their iron status that can improve. Um, there's a lot of things that I feel like we learn in our, our textbook. And then later we're like, oh, that like a heart arrhythmia or whatever is also linked to, to low iron storages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, ferritin storage form of iron is one thing we're looking at, but that's not everything, right? So what else are we kind of looking at in blood work um, or any kind of other things to kind of point out? Like yes. if you're sending, like maybe when you're sending someone to get blood work, what are we looking at? Yeah. I also um, like to know kind of aside from like the serum iron, but the total iron binding capacity, um, which is really just showing us um, how, how much can the body accept more iron? So a lot of times that number is high saying, Hey, we have little binders. We can take more um, because in response to a ferritin being a little bit lower or iron being a little bit lower. Um, I like to, I don't know if you're the same way. I like to look mm -hmm. at um, the mean core puzzle volume, which is just when the red blood cells are smaller than usual. Um, aside from just serum iron, I don't know if you have found the same thing, but I like to know what the transfer and saturation is, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. just the percentage of transfer, um, transfer that is bound to iron. Um, and a lot of people have kind of said that that is um, more accurate than the total iron iron. Um, and I've just gotten really used to assessing that even before I look at serum iron concentration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. And, and, you know, people always like, oh, just order iron. I mean, just order ferritin, but it's like, no, we want your whole iron panel. Like we want to see everything. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, and what about, you know, we often think, okay, well, it's all about iron, right? But there are other micronutrients at play here, you know, that affect iron status and namely, you know, copper, magnesium, vitamin A and all of that. Um, is there anything you kind of want to discuss here? And I mean, I'm happy to chat to you, but um, is there anything you, are, what do you look for there or what do you talk about when you're working with people with iron issues? I'm obsessed with this question because okay. I think that like, <laughs> I love this question so much because at the end of the day, I think that like the way, you know, how I remember my training again to become a dietitian again, like that was multiple years ago. So maybe there's parts that I'm not remembering, but this is where I feel like I've really had to level up as a dietitian working with mm -hmm. endurance athletes because understanding the roles of this um, have been critical to appropriately intervening with athletes. Um, I think that in training or in university, I remember you know, learning about sources of iron and um, how to recommend supplements in order to correct a iron deficiency or low ferritin levels. But with more practice um, in treating athletes, when you do that, and then sometimes those numbers don't improve, you're like, wait a minute. Um, so magnesium for sure is one. Um, I think that they say that most people are deficient in magnesium. It's also, I want to note with that, um, it's a hard one to test in the body. So I'm not urging anyone to go out and get magnesium labs, but as far as when I say deficient, I mean, people just not consuming enough dietary magnesium. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. magnesium is incredible. It's, um, it's responsible for so many processes in the body and specifically, um, for iron, they do associate like reduction in red blood cells 
with not consuming enough um, magnesium. And I would suspect that magnesium has such a critical role in synthesizing ATP or that um, unit of, of energy for, for our body to do work. Um, and so magnesium is a huge role with that. And then iron is, is linked to the production of ATP too. Um, so yeah, ultimately less magnesium, um, less, less red blood cells, less hemoglobin, less iron. Mm -hmm. Um, copper is another one that you mentioned. Um, copper is still tricky. Um, it can both, um, support iron status, but it also too much of it. So if you went out and really supplemented with copper and overdid it, um, you can also, um, you can hurt or, or you can hurt your iron status too. So it can both um, inhibit or support your iron status. Um, it has so many different places throughout metabolism that it impacts iron, but most most importantly and memorable for me is like how it affects it at um, GI absorption. Um, and then vitamin A, this is really cool. Um, have you, do you ever do any micronutrient testing, Claire? I actually haven't done that myself. I mean, yeah, not like beyond what's typically done. Like I'll do, well, no, I do like folate B12, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. But mm-hmm. not, I don't know. What do you, what do you test typically? Um, every now and then if like, you know, have you ever, I don't know if you've ever had like a client where you're just like, okay, their iron's low, but why the heck is it low? And like, yes, like yeah. are you leaking? Like what is happening in the gut, whatever, every now and then I will do like a micronutrient panel. So oh, interesting. Okay. Like, yeah. So you can see like vitamin, it's just not vitamin A is just not a common, like, right. Nobody, no physician is ordering vitamin A labs for the most part. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and so, um, yeah, a lot of times when you see an iron deficiency, you see a vitamin A deficiency as well. Um, and then I also, um, zinc too. So zinc is a little bit like copper. So if you over supplement zinc, you can hurt your iron status. Um, but also a zinc deficiency can exacerbate an iron deficiency as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm usually, I mean, I'm usually encouraging people with all, uh, maybe except for magnesium, um, but with copper, vitamin A, um, you know, vitamin, well, yeah, but I was gonna say vitamin D, but there are instances where we also said that, but with copper, um, vitamin A and, um, oh my God, I'm just blanking what we were talking about. What was the other one we were just talking about? Ah. Zinc. Zinc. Thank you. <laughs> um, trying to really just get that from food. Um, yeah. you know, because again, like people just always forget that there is such this trickle down effect of like supplementation and it's not just about the thing you're supplementing. It can, as you know, we were talking about just influence all of these other things that are going on. And, and also remember like, just having a supplement isn't a like, oh, this is going to, it's no big deal. Like it'll just cover my bases. Like actually it could be harmful in some way. So, um, so yeah, I always try to be cautious with, with what we're supplementing for sure. Um, but as you said, a lot of people are, um, you know, not getting enough magnesium in the diet and obviously want to address food first, but when needed, um, adding some magnesium and supplement form or adding iron or all that stuff. But, you know, like you were pointing at, it's, it's, the the go to thing now is like oh let's just you're you're deficient in iron here's an iron supp- iron supplement right. it's like well okay but like why <laughs> why am I deficient like my ferritin is low it has been like I've had chronic well it's actually not low now it's it's good now but but I'm still trying to get to like the root cause like well why is it low you know like like I eat a lot of iron rich foods like what's going on and so I'm kind of trying to uncover that for myself but it is really just this interesting thing because you know, so many, especially in just typical medicine, it's like, here's a pill. <laughs> Here you go. Bye. <laughs> it so. reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen like a graphic or a GIF of like a leaking faucet, but like that kind of reminds me of like what supplementing with, if with all of these vitamins and minerals we just talked about with, can you imagine every morning taking a magnesium, a copper, a vitamin A, a zinc, an iron, like to correct one thing. It's like, you just, yeah. can't, it's yeah. like trying to stop the leak at so many different sites. And it's really like, this is why, you know, I know we'll get into this, but like overall good nutrition is so important so that it feels like you're not trying to like stop the leak everywhere. Yeah. And, and I mean, so, I mean, this kind of leads into my next question about supplementation versus food. You know, we also, we, of course, I mean, we're dietitians. We also want to prioritize getting iron rich foods and other, you know, micronutrient rich foods in, 
Um, but, you know, obviously there is a time and a place for supplementation, right? So, um, you know, if you're, if your ferritin is like five, <laughs> your food's not going to cut it to kind of get that up, but you want to not just pop a pill. You also want to explore the root cause. So it's kind of doing a bit of both. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess kind of leading to that question of, you know, when should we be supplementing with iron? Um, and you know, how do we know how much to supplement with and for how long? Like, how are we kind of exploring those things? Of course, this is what's considered medical nutrition therapy. This is what we do as um, registered dietitians. Um, so, yeah, what, what do you have to say about that? Like when you're, say, evaluating, you know, blood work um, of a client or, you know, an athlete and um, kind of making recommendations, how do you kind of come up with your recommendations there? Totally. And I think that this is why I don't know if you're the same way, but I feel like most dietitians are whenever people are like, hey, my iron's low and maybe it's a DM or just you know, yeah. a, friend, a friend that's sending you a message, what do I do? And yeah. even if you have those labs in front of you, it's just like, no, we really have to. We assess. can't do that. Like, <laughs> yeah, we can't do that. Um, nope. and I think that like you hit the nail on the head, like understanding before you recommend a supplement, understanding the root cause of like what's going on. And like you just shared of your own experience, sometimes we don't know, but I like to, if we do know a root cause, um, I think it allows us to understand how a supplement protocol is going to stick. Um, for example, sometimes, um, you know, I, I have even been on the other side of recommending a supplement um, really early in my career and like it not doing anything because mm. there's underlying gut dysbiosis. Yep. And at that point, you know, the supplementation was just cute. Or at the same time, like me working um, in combination with a hematologist to correct iron status with, and they're using IV iron and yeah. like same thing, like iron going up and then just crashing after. And so yeah. um, I really like to understand like what is going on. Um, you know, I have seen protocols where it's like, if your iron's this, do this. If your iron's or ferritin's this, do yeah. this. Um, but honestly, like I used to use that kind of stuff and I've kind of gotten away from it just because I think that like learning more and then more evidence around hep hepcidin and that kind of thing has just kind of changed the way that I recommend supplements. So to answer your question, sorry, roundabout answer, but I, no, think I love I mean, all this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I like to, with, with, um, athletes, and this would be like a straightforward case. Typically I start recommending um, supplements, anything under 50, which I don't know what you think. My recommendation is try to get your ferritin as an athlete, not at all to do at least 40, um, yeah. anything less than 50. I think it's fair to say that, you know, there could be a performance benefit for, for that individual to supplement. Um, I work, um, on staff with Atlanta track club, and we actually have like a whole protocol that like we came up with and developed together. And I'm like, man, we should sell this protocol. Cause, <laughs> um, but basically like anything from 20 to 50, um, we're kind of looking at it in combination with physicians, hematologists, and understanding like, why is it? just barely above, like in that range of like bare minimum for, for endurance athletes. Um, we're looking at their overall nutritional intake, um, making sure that there's nothing underlying, um, that might be hurting absorption or storage. And then, like you said, like we're coming up with an intervention that's not just supplement supplements, a part of it, but also what are the other protocols? Like are what are the other, like food interventions. Um, mm. with clients, I like to share like the supplement part of it is just like one part of the intervention, but I'm putting as much weight on like the food side or mm. whatever else might go into it. Um, so I would say anything under 50, I'm kind of curious to adding, um, a little bit more working with professional athletes. I will say we do still supplement over 50. Yeah. Um, 20 and lower, we're really digging into what is going on. Is there relative energy deficiency in sport going on? Um, do they need, to, do they really need to be referred to a hematologist or if it's a female, an OBGYN? Um, does training need to be modified? A deep analysis of why is that um, on the lower side? Um, so yeah, I said 20 and that's like even higher than like what is considered clinically low, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> is it 15? 15 is the, is the lower limit of quote unquote normal or something like that, right? Yeah, it's a, yes, exactly. Right. And so, um, so 
I think I answer the question of like, when do we supplement? But I think understanding the root cause allows us to understand like how, what is the efficacy of this supplement going to be? Um, And then as far as how much, okay, this, my answer for this has changed so much over the years. Like I said, as I understood more about hepcidin, I used to like find these protocols of like taking iron every day and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Where I've kind of stood now is if your iron's lower, now I just predict that like it's going to take more time to increase it. I'm a really big fan of no more than every other day dosing. Um, I've just seen that it it has really helped um, in practice with with, um, some of my clients. How do you feel about that? Like the every other day um, iron supplementation or do you think every day? I've gone both ways, to be honest. Um, and I've seen doctors prescribe both ways as well. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that yet, I would say. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about hepcidin and kind of how that's played into your leaning more towards every other day. Yeah. So like, I think the natural way, and you know, I've dealt with anemia and, um, um, you know, just low, low ferritin levels too. And I think that I'm like, what is the word I'm looking for? Non anemia iron deficiency. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, you know, just in my own body and then working with clients, I've I've seen a little bit more success with every other day. So what hepcidin is, is it's a hormone that helps modulate iron absorption. And so when um it has an inverse relationship with the iron absorption absorption. So therefore, when hepcidin levels in the body are high. Um, then iron absorption is lower. And so I think iron absorption is a sneaky snake. Like it's like, (laughs) it's almost like you have to, it reminds me of like dating in high school. Like you have to pretend not to, to want me or need me. And then like, we'll absorb you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, right. (laughs) I like like for giving science, like some stuff. Um, Yeah. (laughs) yes. Love it. So Yeah. So basically, um, by taking it every other day, um, that has basically like your, um, you're kind of playing towards the cards of hepcidin and Mm. playing with the body's ability to absorb it. Also, um, earlier in the day, hepcidin levels are lower and they even say like within 30 minutes of finishing a workout. Now, obviously I have clients that like are on Synthroid, which are um, thyroid medications, which might impact things or people with really sensitive tummies in the morning or people that are like, what about if you're a morning coffee drinker and caffeine interacts? So there's all these like exceptions to the rules, right? Um, Because iron interferes with everything. Everything. (laughs) Everything. It's impossible. It's impossible. So there's all these like moving parts and individual things to kind of work around with clients. But Um, so with, you know, severe deficiencies, I might try to make it more days than not of the week. Um, Mm -hmm. and it might go with more of like the heavy hitters of iron, or at least work up to that, um, GI tolerance wise. Whereas like, if you are kind of in like the forties to 50 ranges, um, you know, that athlete might benefit from, um, two to three times a week. And then, um, you know, really, I, I kind of, try to understand what are they going to absorb the most? Is it going to be if they want a iron biglycinate because that one's um, easier GI wise than like an elemental iron or something like that, then um, that's fine. But a lot of times, like if they have more of a severe deficiency, um, I like to use more of like an elemental iron or something that um, has a little bit more in it. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because um, I've been recommending like the iron biglycinate because Mm -hmm. it is, you know, I mean, it's, pretty well absorbed and it's, um, it is much easier on the stomach. Um, and it's, it's tricky with the, you know, the whole morning thing. So sometimes people are taking it like at night before bed. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. But, um, but then sometimes what they're doing is they're taking like a larger dose of it or, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's again, this is, this is an area I'm, I mean, I'll be fully honest. Like I'm still learning as a dietitian and learning what works for my own body, um, and reading up on the research, obviously. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts on dosing and the form and what time of day. Yes. Um, I think that it's really, you know, even doing this podcast, I'm like, Yes, I love this area, but this is challenging. Like this is complex. it's hard. <laughs> it is so hard. 
And I think that like, honestly, like we come out of school, we have like this understanding and we, you know, at least I'm like, oh, I know how to correct an iron deficiency Yeah, right. <laughs> in practice. Like it is like, there is so many moving parts to this, yep. um, that, you know, until you don't know what you don't know until you start working with people that have like all these moving parts. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say as far as dosing goes, um, you know, I always say like, before you get so crazy about how many milligrams and stuff like that, um, the most important thing to remember is like, okay, iron is only as good as your body's ability to absorb it. So a lot mm -hmm. of times people will be like, but hemoplex is like 85 mil or whatever. And so I'm like, yeah. that's, that's fine. If you want to use a heavy hitter kind of like that, I've def I've recommended that, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's like, how well are we going to absorb it? Does it give you GI issues? What's going on with that? When are you having it? I am a fan if we're able to, to take it in the earlier part of the day. Um, yeah. as far as forms and stuff like that, I'm with you. Like if someone's whole day is going to be ruined because it's giving them an upset GI tract. And like you said, iron by glycinate, um, you're getting less of like the elemental iron, but it is absorbed so dang well that like, yeah. like if you're be absorbing a lot of it, then um, I think that it's okay that it's not like your traditional elemental iron. Um, and then as far as like form and stuff like this, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts because sometimes like some providers will get on that it has to be liquid or um, ferrous mm. gluconate because like it's going to adhere to the GI tract a little bit better. Um, sometimes I'll do like a combination of like ferrous gluconate um, with like an iron biglycinate and um, just like intermix it with someone that has like a bad deficiency, um, such as like 20 or lower in a ferritin level or their hemoglobin levels are affected too. Um, but yeah, curious to hear like your thoughts on form. Yeah, I mean, I've had people come to me on kind of the more elemental forms and just really struggle with, you know, constipation and issues. So it's like adherence becomes an issue, you know, so people just don't want to take it. So yeah. that's when I kind of switch over to the, the bisglycinate or biglycinate form. Um, and they do have, of course, like you can get like 18 milligrams or 36 milligrams. So sometimes you can increase the dosage. And I know I've tried this on myself, like, okay, well, it's not as much elemental, but I can get a little bit more of it. And that ultimately help bump up my ferritin quite a bit. Um, and just as a temporary measure, I mean, all this really should be temporary. <laughs> um, yeah. but, um, but yeah, you know, it's, so I, I kind of rec often I recommend that that other form just because people seem to not have issues with it in terms of GI stuff. Like almost no one has had issues with it that I put them on it. But um, obviously there are some people, like if they're really not responding to it, then we have to try something else. Like I definitely have some clients right now who are just so low. Um, and we need to change strategies or maybe they're also vegetarian. So that doesn't help. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, so, but, you know, kind of going back to the root cause thing, um, you know, we were kind of talking about the gut and, and all of that. And one of the things I, um, had just started kind of dabbling in a little bit on myself was kind of that PCR stool test, the GI map. I don't know if you've yeah. tried that or have any experience I with use it. it too. You do? Oh, that makes me, um, I'm stoked about that. Yeah, no, um, one of my former guests, Kylie Van Horn, um, introduced me to it. And because I just have so many clients right now with just like off the chart GI issues. <laughs> and it was yeah. kind of getting to the point where I was banging my head against the wall. And I'm like, I need to educate myself further. I enrolled this course, but also like started playing around with various things. So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, so I guess then you're using that to assess the kind of what's going on in the gut, which of course is linked to micronutrient issues amongst all these other things. Is that right? Correct. Because I had yeah. the same experience as you, Claire, of like banging your head against the wall of like, why is this happening? Why yeah. are, is my client getting IV um, iron? And then like their ferritin goes up to 50 and then plummet. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, what I, you know, this is totally like a, you don't know until you know, like, I've had quite a few clients that um, with no success of repleting their iron values, they've, um, and then we find out they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or um, some form of gut dysbiosis. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt, but I have a favor to ask. If you're enjoying this episode, would you please subscribe to the show, share it with your friends or whoever else you think might be into it, and of course, rate and review the show wherever you're listening. All of this supports me and helps keep this show going and growing. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the episode. 
no and I just got my results back and it was fascinating so I'm I'm trying to like I had like the consultation call and I'm going to take this other course to kind of start to understand everything in more detail but I'm I'm kind of and I'm actually um having uh Kirsten screen on um the pod I don't know if you're familiar with her yes, but she does a lot of this functional nutrition stuff yeah, yeah. um yeah, so she's coming on the pod uh, later this month to kind of chat all things functional nutrition and kind of going into this kind of stuff with the gut. So that will be really interesting. So we don't talk about too much of that today, but of course it is linked because, you know, again, we don't want to just be putting water in a bucket with a hole. Like we want to figure out what, why you have a hole and fluck that up. Um, so, you know, again, kind of just sharing with my audience, and I've talked about this many times before on this podcast, but it's really like, you don't just want to throw pills at things. You really want to, um, and food. Yes, of course you want to use food as well, but mo most importantly, you want to ask why and figure that part out. And that's important because otherwise you're going to be dealing with this forever and no one wants to do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, that kind of feeds into this whole, like, you know, I mean, doctors are amazing and all of that, but sometimes, unfortunately, the advice is just so generic and unhelpful and I have I'm sure you do too so many people just being brushed off um you know uh just being like oh that looks fine or just take an iron supplement or just have some leafy greens and it's just like uh yeah no that's really not going to help with my iron that is 16 I mean my ferritin that's 16 or whatever <laughs> so um yeah it, it's uh you know, and just understanding how athletes need a much higher ferritin than is what's considered normal is such like an important thing that I really don't think many people realize, you know. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned altitude. What are you looking for in ferritin for your um, higher altitude athletes? At least trying to be a 50. And then if it's an okay. athlete, like a professional athlete that travels to altitude mm -hmm. for training, um, I like to get them to a 50 before they go out there. Um, just because there's going to be that like temporary drop um, in, in sometimes hemoglobin levels. I've actually came back from altitude and just not scheduled labs appropriately and gotten labs right away and have seen like a little drop in my hemoglobin. And so mm. it's real. Um, and, and that's before like erythropoiesis takes place. And then you create new red blood cells, which is like, obviously like the point of going to altitude um, mm -hmm. just to get that it up um, before they go there, because that natural um, mechanism is going to occur when they're out there. Yeah. And how often are you having your clients get their labs tested? Oh, yes. I think you, uh, you asked me at some point and then I forgot. Um, so if they have a declared like, um, low ferritin, iron, any of those levels, um, then I like every three months, red blood cells have a half-life of, um, 90 days, which, um, I think that that's, you know, normally when we see deficiency and to not want to obsessively check, but, um, mm -hmm. even enough time for, for some of those levels to replete. That's what I recommend. I know getting labs isn't the most convenient or cheap thing, but that's, I would say my plan a, um, I like athletes in general to, if they've ever had an issue with it every six months, again, like access scheduling appointments, you know, that kind of thing, um, that can be challenging sometimes at the bare minimum, if it, it's not an athlete that has ever had issues with it, I, I'm a huge fan of at least once a year, but ideally twice a year, unless you know you have a deficiency. Um, I'm sure you're the same way, Claire. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're nerds and we probably go every three months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I actually have been, uh, I, I kind of was in touch with Inside Tracker recently. And so I was toying with like giving their whole thing a try. Um, but typically I just go to my doctor and get stuff done. Um, do you offer labs in your practice? I do through, um, I have the platform healthy, um, as oh. a separate that I use with my clients and they have a contract with Quest Diagnostics. So I can oh. actually create my own lab panels, which is fun. And I actually do that for myself. It is out of pocket. And so, mm. you know, I won't lie, even when I have the opportunity to use some health insurance, I use it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I will say that, um, doing it this way, typically for my clients, I don't mark up prices. Um, I try to just give them at cost because most of the time I'm like being their cheerleader to want them to do it. And it does, yeah. it is at least less expensive than like, you know, an inside tracker or something like yeah. that I'm gonna make it yeah. as accessible as I can without losing, losing money. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, I'm looking at that GI map test. I mean, it's $389. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I, you know, I'm going to introduce it into my practice at some point, but just again, at cost, just 
yeah. don't know. <laughs> just to kind of play around thing. with it. Like, yeah. I'm a poor businesswoman, but like when we need answers, <laughs> we need answers. It's just, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's so much money as it is. Um, yeah. All right. Anything else on iron that you want to add here that we missed or you think we covered it all? No, I think that we covered it all. I would just say like your point about physicians and everything, just getting like anything else, even if you were to go to a physician with an injury or whatever, just getting really used to like advocate, ask questions. Um, I do, I'm biased, but I do think that dietitians are some of the most equipped to deal with some of these um, situations. And then if you do have a physician, um, some of the um, sports medicine physicians that I do have the privilege to work with, um, some of them are very keen on this and that's, um, that's such a gift. So if you have those physicians, then keep them. Um, but if you don't, then look for professionals such as sports dietitians, because I do think that, I mean, you and I just had a whole conversation about how we've like extended our education to learn more about this so we can better treat yeah. our population. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I will say also just, I don't know what, you know, if you're any of your clients have dealt with it, but, you know, I work with people, you know, all around the country and, um, you know, some people can't even find just like, I mean, forget a sports medicine doctor or a doctor who has experience with athletes, just a doctor. Like oh, that's so true. Things, things are like, like I've had some clients just having a really hard time getting like a PCP. Um, I think just healthcare right now, even, you know, it's not full on in the pandemic anymore, but it's still hard to get in a lot of places, depending on where you are in the country. So Sometimes it's like you're just trying to get a doctor, but then on top of it, like ideally, if you're an athlete, you're trying to get someone who understands, you know, what it is like to be an athlete and what athletes needs are. And I think that's, you can't always count on that. So as you said, like really just understanding it yourself and being able to advocate for yourself. And I've had to do that myself. I've really had to fight to like get my doctor to like order ferritin. I'm like, dude, I have a history of low ferritin. Like this shouldn't be an issue. <laughs> um, but anyways. All right, let's turn to injury now. Um, obviously, there's some injuries we can't prevent. Um, you know, I'm a total klutz. I have definitely fallen and hurt myself. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but outside of accidents like that, obviously, we want to do everything we can um, as as athletes through, you know, smart training and, um, you know, eating enough and really paying attention to our nutrition and recovery and all that good stuff, um, you know, so that we don't get injured. So, I know injury prevention, that's a huge topic to tackle. Um, and we could certainly just spend an hour talking about just this one thing, but maybe we just, you know, we can talk about, okay, well, what comes to mind for you when you think about nutrition for injury prevention? Yeah, I think that it's as simple as answering that question with eating enough. I think that's the number one hands down thing that you can do before we get into like a technical conversation of like mm -hmm. specifics. Um, and the reason I say that is it's impossible to get all of those specific things if you're otherwise just not eating enough. And I think that that's like a big trend that I see athletes, um, you know, kind of, kind of all chasing is they're trying to like eat the perfect foods and stuff like that and totally ignoring simply eating enough to support their activity, which allows um, their body to A, take care of their basic function. Um, and on top of that, um, support their demands that their that their training requires. And so, um, you know, when when they're unable to do that, you make the body fragile. Um, you make it more susceptible to injury. Um, so yeah, I think that before, you know, we break down and start talking about like specific strategies, um, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. enough is the hands down um, most important thing that you can do to reduce the risk of an injury. Yeah, agreed. And I, I've asked this question many times to different dietitians, but I always like to hear what people say. Um, how do you define eating enough? Because of course, you know, people are like, well, I think I'm eating enough. I don't know. <laughs> you know? So how do you, I mean, this is maybe a little tricky to answer. And of course it like, it depends is often the answer, but like, again, what comes to mind when, when you say eating enough, what does that mean really? Yeah, that's a really good question because I think that like, for you and I were like, oh, well, obviously that you take into account like your, your BMR and then like your activities daily living yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, your, and then like your clients like, but oh my God, what do I eat in sandwiches? Yeah, exactly. um, and so for athletes, like the way that I like to lay it out is I'm obsessed with the concept of performance plates. Um, I've, I've seen those on your Instagram. That's so cool. I love it. <laughs> yeah. 
they're so painfully simple. Um, and then, so I think that athletes should at least be having three of those and then fueling every two to four hours and really paying attention to like what, um, what their activities require so that they're eating before, during, and after, especially during, and then after, um, their activities. So athletes are, you know, eating performance plates throughout the day that match their volume and intensity. And then having, um, you know, sometimes two to four snacks per day that help, um, help make up what they're eating in a pre-workout, um, snack or a recovery snack and so forth. And so I think that's a really good start in terms of eating enough. Um, of course, like there's going to be nuances of, you know, the, it depends category of like, how big is the athlete? Do they need bigger snacks or, um, do they need an additional like bedtime snack or, um, how are we going to work in more calories? But I think that mm -hmm. that's like a really good start that we're not skipping meals. We're eating before we train, we're eating possibly during our training. We're eating after our training. We're not going longer than two to four hours without food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you describe what your performance plates are? So in case people don't know what that means. Yes. And, um, I would love to take credit for performance plates, but um, I think that it was Scan that developed um, the performance yeah. plates. <laughs> so no, but I, you're like really pushing them, so I, I'll I'll give you credit. <laughs> thanks, Claire. Um, so what all performance plates have in um, in like similarity is that they're all they're separated into different levels of training. So easy, moderate, hard. Of course, I work with endurance athletes, so our perception of what's easy, moderate, and hard is oftentimes skewed. So sometimes that yeah. requires using it. But what they all have in common is they all have protein, they all have carbohydrates, they all have fats, and they all have colors. So um, this is like low hanging fruit when a client comes to us. But like, if you know a client is missing one of those variables in a meal, or they're skipping a meal altogether, then that's going to make it really difficult to to meet the need of each component of the performance plate. And so that's like right away how I'm going to intervene, like, A, please don't skip the meal. And then B, like, what element of the performance plate are you missing? And how do we um, insert it in the quantity that your body requires it? Um, and so, yeah. And when, then the more you move, the more carbohydrates that you need. And then on the plate, the carbohydrates kind of steal from the fruit and vegetable because fruits and vegetables are great. We need them. Um, but they also have a lot of fiber and they can make us feel really full. Um, they're lower in calories. And so the more we're training, we're eating, um, a smaller volume of that. And then we're filling it with the things that the carbohydrates that are going to be really the energy providers that we and be more, um, calorically dense, relatively speaking to the fruits and vegetables. Um, of course, fruit is arguably a carbohydrate too, but the things that, um, really are going to fuel our body for, for more energy. Yes. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, any other key, key nutrients you want to call out here or strategies that you want to mention in the context of injury prevention? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, with working with athletes, I think sometimes, um, we can get into the headspace of, you know, thinking about it of calories and macros. And I think that some applications that like count macros can be responsible for this, or even, you know, looking at our watches that like tell us how many calories we burn or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And and like I said, eating enough is the number one thing that helps reduce the risk of injury. But however, we're still dietitians. Um, eating foods that are nutrient rich, like I don't think that I'll ever be a dietitian and get super far away from that. And so mm -hmm. what I mean by that of like reducing the risk of injury, why it's important to eat nutrient rich food is they contain um, micronutrients and um, um, antioxidants and um, polyphenols and stuff like that, that really help to reduce inflammation in the body, we're inevitably going to create inflammation in our body. It is not a bad thing. Um, I think that like that word was a buzzword for a little bit where it's like, oh, we have to stop it entirely. But no, like your body can handle it. But as long as you know, you're dosing it appropriately, and you're including the things that are anti-inflammatory on a regular basis, um, so anti-inflammatory polyphenols, which is basically anything with color. Um, I'm a big proponent of spices. So like things like ginger, turmeric, or, um, even red pepper, um, and then using too, this isn't color, but anti-inflammatory fats that like monounsaturated mm -hmm. yep. fats, um, omega-3s. Um, and then 
I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on collagen, not in the supplement form, but at least consuming the foods that like help support your body's own production of collagen, um, is always something that like, I'm kind of talking to my athletes about, um, now, most of the time it's in reference to, should I buy this collagen supplement? I'm like, <laughs> um, but just not to say that it can't help if you're not yeah. already hurt, but, um, but you know, on a daily base maintenance phase, I'm a bigger fan of just eating the things that help support your body's production of collagen. Yeah. I'm, I'm not like calling out collagen specifically in real food form necessarily, but like I'm recommending all of the things that have what you need. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm not being in this particular thing has collagen. Um, but yes, when someone comes to me, like taking collagen, I'm like, why are you taking that? And also because yeah. they're taking it, they're always taking it incorrectly. Number one, um, it's never, cause there is, you know, some research supporting collagen use at a very specific time in a specific dosage with vitamin C prior to exercise, that whole thing. Right. Um, but people are taking it like as a protein supplement. I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's very expensive. so I'm like, I'm yeah. only taking that if I'm desperate, i.e. injured. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I was in Costco yesterday and they're like handing out samples of whatever vital protein or whatever it is. I'm just like, oh God, like, why don't like who people are just randomly buying that stuff. Right. But no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not like specifically being like, and to get collagen and real food, eat this, um, or not too frequently, but, um, yeah. but obviously you can get in. Really. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, yeah. Kind of like, what, anything else that you think that, you know, in terms of reducing the risk, eating enough performance plates, um, anti-inflammatory foods, anything else that you think? That I think, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that covers it. Obviously. I mean, it's not all about nutrition. Like you have to be really smart in your training. You need to respect your body and the signals it's sending and, and get enough rest and, you know, do all of that kind of stuff. Can, I mean, I say control life stress because of course that affects recovery and performance, but obviously like everyone just said their best. <laughs> I, I just try my best. Um, there's only so much you can control, but, um, but you know, so, so I think there, you know, there are lots of things that affect performance. It's not any one single thing. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I always think of like people who are taking like vitamin D and calcium and all these things and they're like barely eating. And I'm like, those supplements are doing nothing for you. <laughs> like, not cause you're just not, anything. you're no. or taking all these micronutrient supplements and they're just like not eating. And I'm like, you just need to eat. Like the supplements aren't going to fix you. <laughs> so, no. um, yeah. So I really do think it just to come full circle, it really comes back to what you said. First and foremost is you got to eat enough. You know, you really do. Um, yeah. that's what's going to keep you healthy. Um, Okay. So on the flip side of this, we both of course get lots of athletes coming to us already injured. Um, and you know, I think I'm sure you've seen your fair share of like stress fractures and other things or other situations due to under fueling or overtraining or whatever. Um, and I think the, you know, nutrition of course plays a huge role here as well. Um, but a lot of people assume that once they get um, injured and they're like no longer running, you know, it's a really tricky thing because we get a lot of people who, or at least I do, they're afraid of weight gain or they're dealing with lower appetites or, you know, they just get really confused as to what they need to do nutrition wise. Um, and they cut back. Um, other times I get people who aren't running, but they're like cycling like a maniac. So they're like, <laughs> they're like really, really active, but they're like, Oh, well, I'm not active. I'm not running. I'm like, dude, you're like, on an hour on the bike every day, like, come on. Um, so, you know, <laughs> like, oh, athletes. Um, I mean, I'm an athlete too. And I'm, I'm sometimes an idiot. We're well. a special bunch. Yeah, we are. We are. I, I include myself in this, like, eye roll. Okay. Cause I've done my fair share of stupid things, but, um, you know, just kind of, they get into this space with nutrition. You know, we know that those types of behaviors, it's only going to hurt them more as their body's trying to heal. So let's start by, um, you know, you outlining what nutrition strategies you're usually employing with your athletes during times of injury. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that you were alluding to that, you know, there's the tendency to over cross train or try to maintain a fitness level mm. and not lose any fitness or control the size of one's body or whatever. And literally like everything that you were saying, I was thinking of specific names of clients. <laughs> Um, and so just, you know, and at the same time, like their injuries, not, um, following a normal healing cascade. Right. 
-hmm. And so, um, you know, non-healing injuries and stuff like that. And so I think the number one thing that like, I try to get my um, clients to understand when they're going through an injury and, you know, we're athletes too. So I think that our logical brain understands this, but then there's the, also our empathetic, uh, athlete heart, like empathizes that like a lot of times when you're injured, you're not thinking with a logical brain. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that's something that really helps us level with athletes, but healing an injury is a anabolic. So when, um, in order for an injury to heal, um, that anabolic process of healing costs energy. And so this means that like, you have to eat enough, um, to, for your body to have the raw materials for it to heal that injury. And I mean that I think a lot of times, like the healthcare society, like understands that like bone requires a lot of nutrition, but I mean that too, for soft tissue. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes like people are really quick to say with soft tissue things that like, it's not nutritional. And I'm like, maybe nutrition didn't cause it, but, um, maybe it did. And (laughs) it all requires nutrition to heal it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, just like we need, um, more energy when training for sports or, um, for our activities, um, we need, um, calories to heal an injury. And so I like to break it down into three different phases. And again, just like I didn't create performance plays, I didn't create these phases of healing, but honestly, like understanding the different phases of healing, um, as a provider helped me to, um, orchestrate a, a nutrition protocol that matches the phases of healing. Um, so number one with acute injury, a lot of times we we're not working with people at this stage, but it's the Mm -hmm. kind of that initial inflammatory stage. It's more acute. Um, if we happen sometimes, like, unfortunately, if I'm working with someone, they happen to get hurt or whatever I can, um, intervene, but a lot of times like they're kind of past this phase, if they're working with us to heal an injury, um, if they happen to be working with us, that's kind of where we're using some of the things that we were just talking about that helps to reduce the risk of injury. Now we're using it, um, to kind of help that inflammation stage. Um, stage two is kind of that proliferation regeneration. That's where we need more, um, more calories, depending on the type of injury and the site of the injury. This is wild. Your BMR can, or your basal metabolic rate, AKA like your metabolism can increase from 15 to 50%, depending on the trauma of that injury. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Like 50%. So like, if it's something that requires surgery, it's going to be on the higher end. Um, Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm like the working in the rehab hospital um, was really cool to kind of, you know, these are different injuries, like car wrecks, that kind of thing. But like, Mm -hmm. you have people on like tube feeding and like you're blasting calories through them and meaning like you're controlling exactly how much they have and they're losing weight. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's like super eye opening, like literally like putting 4,000 calories in a tiny human and then watching them like lose weight during like a car accident. It just puts it into perspective, like for me, like, okay, injuries do take a lot of calories and stress and that kind of thing. Um, so there's that stage. And then for me, um, there's the return to sport. And I think that that's a super critical phase because again, like, you know, you get the athlete that's now getting back to sport. They want to maybe feel light or poppy or whatever. And they're not, um, paying attention to, they've just healed an injury and now they're getting back to activity. So maybe they're seeing us in the first place. They never learned how to properly fuel activity. And now's their opportunity to learn how to do that. Um, so if, you know, they have a injury and it, the whole root cause of it was nutrition. They never learned, you know, how to properly fuel it because that's super normal because some of the stuff is not common knowledge, then it's Mm -hmm. a great opportunity to teach them hey, this is an increase in demands. This is how we properly do this. Um, I don't know if you've seen the same thing, but like a lot of times when there's an injury, especially a bone stress injury, if you're not kind of addressing these things, then there's sometimes a subsequent bone stress injury. And so I was thinking of like in a different site. And so how do we reduce the risk of, of a new injury too? Yeah, no, for sure. Thank you for breaking all that down. Um, 
in terms of the different phases, um, I want to focus on phase two for a minute because, of course, that's the one. I mean, well, nutrition is is always important, but that's one where nutrition needs increased tremendously and where I feel like people often have resistance. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious kind of what types of strategies you use there um, to kind of help people get enough in, um, how you're helping support them if they're struggling mentally with that, because, I mean... I'm sure you've been injured before. I know I've been injured before. It is not fun. Um, and it's hard to kind of then put tons of food in your body and you're just not into it. And Or maybe you're into it, but you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's harder, let's just say. And your appetite might be off and all of that. Um, and of any other protocols you might be using, especially for bone injuries, I'm curious to kind of hear your approach there. Yes, I'm so glad we're revisiting this. Um, so like you said, a lot of times that's the stage where activity, you know, maybe their ability to cross train isn't what they wish that it was going to be. And they're like really starting to be in their feelings of, about their lack of activity, but then there's this great need for nutrition. Right. Um, so I really like to take a step back and ask them like, what is, what is your goals? Like, what is your number one goals? And a lot of times like their goals are to be better than they ever were. And mm -hmm. so I think that like just getting on that side with them um, and being like, I'm on your team and this is how nutrition and just like that education of how nutrition plays a role in that, um, I think is really important. And then on the actual like logistical side of like, what do you do with the nutrition? Um, something that I didn't mention the first time I talked about calories and how that affects metabolism, but protein is super critical in this phase. And so um, I've seen different protein ranges um, being thrown out. Normally I use like a constant of, you know, if we're using the, the kilograms of body yep. weight, um, 1.4 to 1.8 mm -hmm. um, for, for injuries. Normally, like I settle 1.6 to 1.7, but 1.4 to 1.8 is kind of a, a good range. Yep. And um, the thing about protein is, um, you know, just like protein any other time of your life, it doesn't want to be consumed at all one time. So protein spacing is really, really important for like maximum absorption and everything. Um, making sure again, like we're eating enough calories and then, then we can have the conversation about protein and then we can have the conversation about these specific um, micronutrients that play a role in whatever type of injury. So if it's a bone stress injury, are we meeting the recommendations for calcium and vitamin D and some of the other ones like magnesium, vitamin K, those, those kinds of things that play mm -hmm. in, in bone healing. Um, so yeah, did I, an did I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just a quick note for my listeners, it's uh, 1.4 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight in case that wasn't clear. I mean, it, yeah. to me, it was obviously, but, <laughs> uh, just in case anyone didn't get that. Um, what are you, are you adding supplements in this phase? I do for bone stress injuries. Yeah. Um, I'm a really big fan of, of using calcium and vitamin D. Yeah. Um, sometimes I see physicians kind of go over what my um, recommendations, but normally um, for bone stress injuries, um, I think the recommendation is 1500 milligrams of calcium and then 2000 I use of vitamin yeah. D. But with vitamin D, oh my gosh, like I'm a bigger fan of getting labs and then supplementing what the labs actually yes. Yes. Um, represent <laughs> rather than like just the recommendation of 2000 IUs. I don't know if your vitamin D has ever been low, but like whenever I've supplemented yes. vitamin D, it's like 2000 IUs is like cute. It's like, yeah, <laughs> a lot of times it's like low. That's not going to do a big, um, anything too significantly to influence those levels. So bigger, bigger fan of testing vitamin D levels, because again, like on the other side, um, fat soluble. So, um, you can reach toxicity if you're over supplementing. Yeah. Yeah. And and also, I mean, we're, you know, it's May now, so hopefully everybody can kind of get outside and expose themselves to a little sun. Um, I mean, you live in Florida, so I'm yeah. in California, um, so I'm definitely getting some sunshine, um, and that should absolutely be a part of the vitamin D process as well. Um, okay, awesome. Um, I think we already answered my other question I had about kind of helping athletes deal with the emotional struggle with it all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think this is where being, you know, athletes ourselves is really helpful because I mean, I don't know about you and maybe you can share any stories you've had, you know, surrounding personal you know, injury yourself. Um, but I know what it feels like to be sidelined and it really sucks. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I think just being able to kind of 
yeah, as you said, empathize and try to, I know for, for me with my clients, I really try to, um, and this is actually, I will say things I try to do before injury ever happened. So if I'm working with athletes, I really try to encourage that they cultivate some other hobbies or ways to reduce stress. Um, they have other tools in their toolbox. It's not all running all the time. I know it's something that I've done for myself over the years that has helped so much. Um, I think you know, having some other things that you enjoy is just a good, healthy thing, generally speaking. But certainly if you are injured or you can't do your sport for whatever reason, being able to do something else that I know it's not the same, it's not going to give you that same sense that runner's high or whatever else, right? But um, it does kind of make you happy and it is an outlet of some kind. So I try to like kind of preemptively cultivate that stuff. Um, and then, of course, during times of injury, we really lean on that. Um, because even like, say, when someone isn't injured, but maybe they have a tendency to kind of go a little too hard on the training side and you're trying to pull them back a bit, um, you know, and, and get more food in and do all that stuff. It's like saying, OK, well, I know you really enjoy exercise, but hey, what about all this other stuff you said you'd enjoyed? Right. So I don't know about if you do any of that ever, but that's something I really enjoy doing with my clients. Yeah, I think the whole identity thing with endurance athletes is a huge thing that like yes. <laughs> generating other interests, but not only is that important <laughs> in creating these other um these other, you know, interests and stuff like that and things that you enjoy, those are actually like I think that should be on the preventative side too to yes. keep from overtraining and honestly like to keep your mental health in check because like you're not always going to have good races you're not always going to have good performances but you have to enjoy like you're or understand you're much more than an athlete so i would say yes definitely support that leaning on a little bit harder whenever we're um taking a break from exercise the funny thing about you saying that claire the first time i heard your podcast i was in a down season and i was listening to you and kelly pritchett talk oh nice yeah. And I was literally on like a little coffee walk because I was like trying to find something fun for myself. And so like I went to a coffee shop, got a coffee and then went on a walk and listened to you and Kelly. And I it like helped me like learning something like helped me stay disciplined with because I wasn't hurt, but I was just trying to be disciplined with like, no, you're not supposed to be running like. <laughs> you know. um, so it's funny that you mentioned that. But yeah, finding other things that you enjoy. Um, so yeah, I always like to uh, to expand my cooking and food prep skills because that's something that I like to nerd out about. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I think early on in my career and as a, you know a, a nutrition student, all that I was all up in the cooking and recipes and baking and all that stuff and. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the pandemic that killed it for me or just having kids. I don't really know what it was, was. but I, I just like. I think it's like having to deal with dinner time with my family. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to cook. But I've kind of like, I mean, it's fine. And it's not like I don't ever enjoy cooking. Like it can be really relaxing. But I, it's funny how that no longer is my go-to as a dietitian. And I'll have clients be like, oh, I want some recipes or this and that. And I'll be like, okay, here's this dietitian and that dietitian and this dietitian. They all have great recipes on their website. But I don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for me, and, and it's, you know, this is great timing because I'm, you know, on my recovery week. and. I think normally maybe on day four uh, after like a big race, I would be like, oh, I'm going to do a little like super easy, you know, three mile run or something. And I told myself, even if I could run, I was like, I'm going to take a full week off. I'm going to do nothing, like absolutely yeah. nothing. Like I normally would walk, but it was like raining. I was like, eh, you know, I have a lot going on. So I've instead been gardening, but not like hard gardening, like I really that. easy gardening. That's a huge hobby of mine. And, um, and probably I'll probably go for a run maybe tomorrow. Cause it will be, have been a week, but, um, but again, it's like, just like you said, you know, it's, it's okay. You have this plan and sticking to it. If you find that's hard, it's just so much more, it's easier to do if you have these other things that you really enjoy and truly like are satisfying. And so like gardening for me is that way, or like arts and crafts or just like other creative outlets, even the podcasting like this, like, I love having these conversations. It's been such like a just nice way to connect with people and chat about things. So um, I'm always a huge, huge proponent of encouraging, you know, please like cultivate other hobbies. I know you're a runner. Like I identify as a runner too. And even though I'm not competitive anymore or anything like that, I just do all for fun. But, um, but please try to get some, even if it's just like, I love listening to music or yeah. I love reading a book, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to like learn to knit or something, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, 
<laughs> so yeah, I think that's a huge one in all of this. And yeah, if you take it as an opportunity to learn something, like if you're listening to the show right now and you're on a walk, great, awesome, love it. Um, anything else that you think is important to keep in mind during injury or anything else that we didn't highlight? I think that that is it. The only thing we kind of touched on it that I would also like to add about the um, the glaring question, like, will I gain weight? Like that oh, yeah. question, yep. I get it all the time. And um, the thing that I like to say is, I don't know what your body will do, but I know how to make your body heal. Um, and nobody can tell you what your body is go- the size of your body's going to do. Um, they'll try to sell you that they know what it's going to happen, but they don't. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, in order for you to get back, like I am confident of like, you know, using some of these principles for it to heal. And then once you get back and you're kind of training and you're fueling appropriately, your body's going to even out. Um, and I would much rather an athlete get back to their sport a little bit heavier but healthy and able to be 110% than um, a prolonged injury um, like you and I have noticed or never get back yeah. in the way that they can or it take forever. Um, yeah, I've just had a lot of experience with that. And more times than not with my um, clients that really embrace this, um, what ends up happening is their bodies normalize or they realize the weight that they were at wasn't actually like appropriate for, for where their body wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love all that. And I actually have a version of that discussion with people who are not injured, who are under fueling because Mm -hmm. they're maybe they're also afraid of gaining weight and they're like, oh, won't I gain weight if I eat so much more or I'm afraid of this? And I say the same thing. Like, I don't know how your body's going to respond. You may or may not gain weight because I've also seen people eat a bunch more food and their weight stays the same um, while they're training uh, because their body just needs it that badly. Um, But you know, but I tell them, but I know that eating more is going to help you and it's going to make you feel better. And that is way more important than whatever that number is. Right. And cause that's what yeah. we're going for. We're, we're going for you feeling better. We're going for you having longevity in your sport, um, you know, being healthy and, and all that good stuff. Right. So, um, so I think it kind of is both sides of things really. It's, it's, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap up our injury discussion. Thank you for taking us through iron and, uh, and injury and all that. Um, you, I know you already shared kind of what's on the horizon for you, any new or old projects or anything else you want to share with, um, my audience? Um, the only thing is that with meteor, um, we, we work one-on-one with clients, but also, um, we're developing a fun membership and we're kind of ironing out exactly what that looks like, but we were wanted to, um, provide some impact, um, even for the athlete that doesn't necessarily want to come to nutrition meetings, because Mm -hmm. I don't think that every, you know, everyone that wants to improve their nutrition has to necessarily fit in the criteria of wanting like, you know, a scheduled appointment. So that's on the horizon for meteor nutrition. Um, and yeah, I think that that that's it, Claire. And I saw you have two uh, other dietitians working under you now. Yes, I'm right? so excited. And they're both runners um, and have a lot of experience working with runners and endurance athletes. Um, it was just like a, a way that I could grow without, um, you know, overfilling my calendar so I can be 100% present with my clients. I kind of hard cap there. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about adding both of them um, in terms of, of the direction that we're growing. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We're going to wrap up with some quick bites questions. Okay. So what is your favorite meal or snack when you're in a hurry? In a hurry, I love a smoothie, which I feel like is the most dietitian of all dietitian. Yes. Um, I hate it. I'm so sorry. I try to not be super crunchy with my dietitian. <laughs> so eye roll, but it is so easy to just throw things, everything you need, all the elements of a performance plate in a blender and then make it portable. So I'm sorry for that answer, but that's, that's what I had for breakfast. So, <laughs> cause I was not hungry and obviously I had to get my nutrition in. So I just blended it all up and sipped it in the car. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's great for appetite suppression too. And I live in yep. Florida. So go yep. 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 Um, favorite meal or snack when you're not in a hurry. Ooh, I love, um, I'm a big fan of any kind of seafood. And then normally I like to pair it with, um, any kind of potato. I'm not picky fingerlings, sweet potato, red potato, any kind of potatoes. Um, and then 
I mostly really love cruciferous vegetables. So like any kind of like broccoli or Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, those, I just love the texture of them so much. Mm. Um, so I would say, yeah, some kind of seafood, potato, cruciferous vegetable. Awesome. Favorite post-race meal or snack? Ooh, um, I'm a big burger and fries fan. Um, especially if it's a marathon, I'm like, where is this mm-hmm. food? I've literally yeah. like, I've literally, I don't know why, but booked a flight like right after I probably to save money and then regrets later, um, after a marathon and then forgot what time my checkout was. And I have been like caught by the, um, cleaning ladies, like sitting in the bathtub, eating a burger and fries. After. <laughs> and she's like, you have to leave. You have to leave. I'm like, Please tell nobody this, but now I'm on a podcast sharing. So. I love it. I love it. That's gotta be, by the way, the most common answer to that question. Some form of burger fries. Um, yeah. What has been your worst race nutrition experience? Okay, so it I have been so fortunate, but okay, I have two answers. That 50k, obviously, I didn't know what nutrition was. So every aid station, I'm like, well, they have potatoes here and M and M's. Um, <laughs> so I would say potatoes yeah, are great. <laughs> yeah, I actually ran 33 miles because I was bonking and got lost in the forest. Lovely. Um, so I would say that that probably should be high on the list. Um, when I qualified for the Olympic trials the first time, I got a side stitch just trying to do a gel on top of a sports drink at like mile six, which is really early in the race. But that I kind of was really patient and worked out of, but I basically couldn't get nutrition down from like 10K to the half, which is a really long time for me. Mm. High calorie, like I'm. Yeah lots of calories type of person. Um, and I think because at at that point it was like my biggest athletic accomplishment that I'd ever done. I was really like frustrated with it. Yeah. What, what are you typically aiming to take in calorie or carb wise in a race? Ooh, I am like, I'm a 90 to 100 grams of, if I have access to fluids, I for sure I'm trying to get like 100 grams of carbs per hour. Um, I've just kind of found like, those are my best races. Um, when it's, when I just have access to gels, I'm like low key panicking that I won't be able to get in enough, but I work with a lot of elites. So it's really funny that, um, you know, there, a lot of them aren't as high and I'm always so curious, Claire, like, could they run faster? I don't know. Um, but I just feel so much better on the higher end of the range. Yeah. Well, um, I, was it Steph Bruce that I just talked to you about this or yeah, I think it was Steph. We were, we had a whole discussion about how she like only grabbed a few gels or something in a rate in a marathon. And I mean, she has got stuff going on anyways, but, yeah. but no, I've had that same thought. Um, but yeah, go you with doing 90 to 100 grams. What kind of, uh, sorry, I know we're getting off track here, but I'm doing a little mini, uh, athlete nutrition profile here. Um, but what kind of products are you using to get stuff in? Yeah. With fluids. Um, if I have access to fluids, I like the Morton 320. I do really yeah. well with it. Um, I like the alternating between like the one with caffeine and not with caffeine. Um, Mm -hmm. I have found that that's like a really good mix for me. I tolerate it super well. And then if I don't have access to fluids, I've been really liking, um, the Huma gels and I Mm -hmm. like the amount of the ones that have caffeine, like a lot of them times like 25 milligrams of caffeine. So it's not so much. So I've really been liking those lately. Um, I have tried to get away with like the more in gels without, so I'm not a super salty sweater or Mm -hmm. I'm not a heavy sweater in general. So like depending on conditions, sometimes I will try to like free sodium load and then get away with like the Morton. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with like racing sometimes when it's warmer, I've like been like, eh, I should probably get some sodium and just try to kill um two birds with one stone with like yeah. Sodium. Yeah. Yeah. The Huma is nice because it has like more sodium in in there than a lot of other gels do. Yeah. Which is convenient. Um yeah. all right, moving on. Biggest cooking catastrophe if you've had one. Biggest what? Cooking catastrophe if you've had one. Oh my goodness. This is hysterical. And so when I first got out of um, school, um, there was, he's actually my strength coach and he like a lot of times helps me develop content. He's a photographer too. Um, Mm -hmm. When I first got out of school, he was like, oh, we should create cooking videos. And so (laughs) he's just really savvy with all kinds of media. And he's always wanting to do projects with people in the community. And so he had this platform to do it. I'm like 22, 23. And he's at basically asking me to be like Rachel Ray and an expert <laughs> person at the same time, Claire. And I, I'm not savvy in cooking at that time. B, I'm awkward with like doing stuff on camera. 
Um, I have no media skills at this point. And then also I'm like ripe out of school. And so like, I'm a walking textbook at best. And yeah. so, <laughs> so I'm like trying to cook on TV. And I think we were making fajitas and we were talking about how you can like make multiple meals out of like Mexican food and like repurposed meals. And it was so painful that like, I could never rewatch it now. I'm pretty sure he never like posted it or whatever, but yeah, I forget what he said to me. It was something along the lines of like, we'll just use that as a practice round. <laughs> oh God. Oh, that was a nice, nice way of letting you know that that didn't work out so well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, how do you like your eggs cooked? Oh, um, I'm a big poached fan person. Um, I have like a po- an egg poacher that I like to use. Yeah. What is your favorite beverage? Um, I, oh gosh, I am one of those like carbonated water junkies, but it's not my favorite. I would say I'm a big fan, again, like Frenchy dietitian stuff. I really like kombucha tea. Um, I feel like I, I can hydrate it from it really well, but I like wine too. So I don't want to act like I don't love wine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, that question used to be what, like, what is your favorite, like alcoholic beverage essentially, but someone pointed out to me, I should really just make it beverage. So I let people choose how they want to take that question. <laughs> Um, yeah what are your comfort foods my mom's shrimp and grits my mom um is like the best cook that I've ever met and she that's like her way of loving people and actually like she's who I credit for having a good relationship with food um just because like she never made it such a big deal so like it's just so comforting she always cooked in a way that was like super neutral And I really appreciated that, um, about her when I was first a dietitian, I was like, you're not healthy, but with more experience and that kind of thing, I'm like, oh, I actually love that you were very neutral of like how you introduced foods to us and her shrimp and grits are just off the chain. If you've ever had shrimp and grits, Southern thing, um, you will never be able to eat them in a restaurant again. If you've had my mom's. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? anything that's like birthday cake or butter pecan, which is really strange to me. I would think that I would be like a chocolate person, but um, yeah, I think that my ice cream taste has evolved as I've gotten older. And last but not least, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. I saw this question that you were going to ask me and I hated my answers. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I try to be like, oh, you don't need all the fancy stuff. And then like my number one answer is I really love my Norma Tech boots. Um, uh, that's okay. That's all right. Yeah. No judgment. Um, no judgment. Um, I do, gosh, I guess I am a shoe junkie. So she, I mean, running, it's so simple. Like it's like you just need a good pair of shoes. So I can't not say shoes. Um, Norma Tech boots. And I guess the third one. Um, no, I guess like anything sports nutrition product. Love it. Yeah. Great answer. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. Where can everyone find you online? Question. I'm sports dietitian Kelsey on Instagram. And then um, to throw you a curveball on Facebook, I have a Facebook community called Endurance Sports Nutrition. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for chatting with me. This is so much fun. I've been following you online forever. So Again, like I, I love these opportunities to talk with my colleagues and just chat and get to know people a bit better. So thanks for your time today. Claire, thank you so much for having me. And I had I had a blast chatting it up all things iron metabolism and injury with you. Awesome. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Bye. All right. That's our show for today. Thanks again, Kelsey, for chatting with me. Okay, guys, you know what I'm going to ask. If you're enjoying my podcast and want to keep these episodes coming along, the biggest way you can support me is by subscribing to my show, sharing it with others, and rating and review it wherever you listen. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, see you all next time.